There we go. Should be good to go, good to go, I think. There we do. All right, uh, I will reshare the handout in the chat. Hello everyone, I'm Mistress Elena Hilton uh, and I will be teaching the class today. If uh, I just dropped the link into the chat, if for anyone watching this in the future on YouTube, uh, the link to the handout should be uh, either in the description or in one of the comments. Uh, and so if you see the uh, docs.google, you do not need to have the handout open. Honestly, the handout is kind of this entire class, but all written down and broken out by section. Uh, so feel free to knit, sew, you know, just sit back and listen. You don't need to have the handout out. Um, I'll be covering all of the information in it. It's really there more for you to be able to look back uh, in the future to be able to reference this. And let me readjust my windows. So I, however, am going to be using the handout as my notes for this evening. So I will not be able to see the chat window as such. If you have any questions, um, sorry about my cat meowing in the background. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the chat window when we get through the, the breaks between sections uh, pretty frequently. Then, Lissa, when we get to different breaks, if you can read them out. Definitely. All right. Uh, so if you did happen to open the handout, you'll note that the title I gave this class initially was How to Research Like an Academic, Moving Towards a Major ANS Project. So what's important is this is not an advanced class in the sense that you have to have a lot of pre-existing information. In fact, this class was designed with the goal of taking someone from a zero knowledge, prior experience background and taking them all the way up to being able to create a project uh, that scored very well. One moment, Dresden, go upstairs. <laughs> I apologize. Um, his peoples have moved to different floors. It is the end times for, for the poor cat. Um, and so uh, the, while this class is going to have a lot of very useful information, this is not a requirement if you want to get involved in ANS. I've had people come to take this class in the past uh, and they're looking to just sort of dip a toe in and ended up feeling very overwhelmed. That is, this is going to help put you on a very strong, solid path towards success, towards uh, creating a project that maybe could score well, maybe even hit the finals at ANS champs for your kingdom, uh, or create another uh, similarly very highly focused on good scholarly work and grounded with a lot of good sources. Um, but if that is not your goal, no worries. Um, you can take a lot of these elements and maybe not take them to the full extreme that I recommend. You could also sort of backtrack some of this uh, if you're just getting started and you're looking to do more of a, a simple starting project. Uh, so as a quick introduction, first about myself. Hi, I'm Mr. Selena. Uh, I am the Deputy ANS Minister for the East Kingdom. Um, I, however, mundanely, I teach reading and research skills at Salem State University. Uh, and so I did that prior to getting involved in the SCA. And this class was originally written pretty early in my SCA career as I was trying to learn, well, I had all of these research skills, I was trying to figure out how to apply them in the SCA context. Uh, and so I joined all of these different Facebook groups for how to write research, how to do documentation, uh, different ANS groups. And I saw some general themes that really came out of people had a lot of questions about what are sources, how do you find them, how do you evaluate them, how do you turn that into a project. And so this class came together as sort of the most common issues that I saw people running into and the things that I found most useful for myself when going to put together some of my first uh, very major projects. Uh, again, the handout is really designed for you to be able to go back and refer to later on in the future. So on the first page, it actually has a page guide letting you know where to jump to in the different sections. 
Uh, likewise, if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, if you need to come back and jump around to different parts, uh, that might give you some advice as to roughly where in the video you should find them. I say as I accidentally make changes to my handout. All right. So getting into the actual thing, do we have any questions in general uh, before we get started? All right, sounds good. Any. Oh, did we? No, I was just gonna say, I don't see any, sorry. All right, so first, where to start? So a research project, and by a research project here, I don't mean the like rubric term of a research project versus a general project. Um, a research project could be a paper maybe, but it could also be you know whatever item you're creating, but whatever your personal project is that's going to be moving forward uh, for this ANS purpose usually starts with some sort of question or a topic. So your question or topic might be, how were 14th century widgets made? Or it might be your recreation of a 12th century widget. Or you know maybe it's an informative piece talking about widgets in 1580s London. A lot of times when you first get started, you might have a general idea, but you might not have it completely narrowed down, and that's OK. But starting with that general concept of like, OK, well, it's definitely going to be about tablet weaving and probably like later period and not really sure about the countries because I haven't done enough research to know what the differences might be. But I know I like late period tablet weaving. Cool. That will give you an area to start the focusing in on. But we're really starting with initial research. And you'll note that I say we're starting with initial research, not initial crafting. Uh, because I think, and we'll get onto this a little bit more as we go through, uh, you really definitely want to start with your research before you progress to the actual physical item. Now, if you already have like an extant physical item that you want to work from, maybe you don't need to do as much uh, narrowing down, but you still need to do this initial research um, to get some more basic information and basic ideas. At this stage, this is the time when really anything goes. We're not super worried about the quality until we dig in a little more. So Wikipedia for general ideas about things, Pinterest you know, without checking meticulously every item just to get a feel for what kinds of things you like, uh, and basic Google searches, uh, other people's SCA documentation. That can all be really helpful this, to sort of narrow down where you wanna go, do you have um, a strong idea of like, okay, well, I like this aesthetic, I like this technique. Okay, so you can use these different resources to try to get a little bit more information uh, and pick that up. So as you look through, you know, some of these basic Google searches or other folks SCA documentation, um, you're not going to want to take everything as fact that you see there, but are there certain books or articles or museums that a lot of people are mentioning? Um, are when you like are scrolling through on Pinterest, are you realizing that there's this one artist from period and you really like their work and the, the colors and the patterns and the, the shapes that's really feeling more your thing? Great. Those are going to help you narrow down to get started in on your research to get a better idea of time, place, social context. So specifically some things you want to focus in once you have this more narrowed in space to really sort of define it uh, is a lot of what in the rubric side of things um, we would look at and refer to as the historical context part of the piece. Uh, so this is going to be really useful in deciding, oh, well, hey, I want to use this die, and it was definitely period. Well, it existed in period, but would it have been used for that specific type of item? Would it have been used in that social class? That's all information that can be really helpful to figure things out. So similar to back if uh, they made you write these types of things uh, in um, high school and before, the where, when, who, why, how, where? So is this, are you looking just at England? Are you going super narrow to like Paris or London or specific uh, town in, in later periods or certain areas you might want to? Are you going more broad, Western Europe? 
that's a pretty broad area. So if you're going to say that something was common throughout all of Western Europe, you might need to do a little more research uh, to be able to support that it really was common throughout that whole place. Uh, likewise, uh, if you're going to go with a very narrow area, that can give you a stronger connection to that historical place, but it means you're going to have to be more careful with the sources that you use in order to make sure they all apply to that. So knowing the location, uh, next, when? And this is one of those things that can really vary depending on the time period you're working in due to the issues with dating things. So when we say something was 8th to 10th century, do you mean it was used throughout a 200 year period of history? Or do you mean, well, we have this extant item and the closest they can date it to is 8th to 10th centuries. Okay, well, that's going to be, those are both valid options, mm -hmm. but it's helpful to have that sort of in your head of what you're looking at there. Um, often, if you're looking at later stuff, we can get more specific, you know, maybe even dialing down to a certain year or, you know, a certain decade. Um, you also want to check in who because the items that uh, maybe were common through one social class definitely weren't necessarily the same ones being used in other social classes. Uh, for example, I threw some examples in the handout, upper class, royalty, clergy, merchants, everyone, farmers. There's some interesting smocking techniques that you see on a few very specific types of uh, religious garments worn by priests at a certain point of uh, celebrating mass. And it's a really cool smocking pattern that you really don't see anywhere else in this early period. This is, I want to say it was like somewhere between 12th and 14th century, um, but it was very interesting and unique. And the problem is, from what I've seen, you do not see it anywhere else except on this very specific type of clergy uh, clothing. So if you were to take that type of smocking, I, you know, it clearly exists. We have an extant, you know, several, I think, extant finds with it. But if you wanted to put it on, say, a woman's dress, well, that wouldn't really be applicable. Just because something existed in period doesn't mean it existed in the way you're thinking of using it. So understanding social class and how that impacts maybe the dyes that would have been used, the fabric choice, the materials, um, and the various methods are all really important things for you to know. And you might start with one focus in mind for any of these, and then as you do more research, you might end up reshifting it again, and that's totally okay. Uh, finally, we have the why or the how. Uh, what was the purpose of these items? That's a really important thing for you to have an idea of because, again, it can impact the materials and methods, but it's really good, useful for you to know, hey, is this something that's mostly decorative or is this something that was mostly functional or both that might influence what your priorities are for how you recreate it in how you're envisioning your recreation of this. So once you have this sort of general idea of your topic and your research goals, that's when we're going to start moving on to how to find sources that are good quality sources uh, that are going to be applicable to your area and uh, support your research. So um, anyone have any questions before we move on to sources? I did not notice any questions. Awesome. And my apologies, I'm reading a little more from the handout right now. I'm dealing with some medical issues currently that are causing some, uh, I'm not at my best. Uh, and so normally this would be also a little more interactive, uh, but with the online format, uh, we'll open it up to more broader questions and discussions at the end once we finish going through all of this. And if anyone wants to ask uh, privately about their own personal research topic, feel free to reach out to myself, to Mistress Lissa, uh, or to others in the MOAS office. We are very happy to help you with your research projects. Um, also, you can do uh, sign up for an ANS consultation through the MOAS website. Uh, show, tell us what your current project or ideas or goals are, and we can connect you with someone either in our office or someone who's an expert in that area who can give you feedback and support tailored to your project and your goals. So. Little plug there for the MOAS office, other stuff. All right, moving on to sources. So what is a source? Oh, Hi, Lisa, I'm did you sorry. say something? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. 
Um, I'm from Trimeris, so a little bit away. Is that resource still applicable for someone outside your kingdom? Mistress Lissa, are the ANS consultations available to people outside of our? So you definitely can reach out to myself personally. Uh, I'm to Lissa personally as well. Yeah, um, I would say just reach out to us personally if you need help. Like we'll hook you up because SCA and ANS. Um, the official okay. consultation thing is probably something that we want to keep in kingdom um, just because I don't think we could handle the volume of every kingdom. But yeah, just email us and we'll, we'll work with you. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you watching this on YouTube in the future, uh, if you visit the M East Kingdom MOAS website, which you can just get to by Googling uh, East Kingdom MOAS, um, then it, that has all of our contact information on it as well. Uh, also, my contact information is on the handout. All right, sources. So what is a source? A source could be uh, a text, um, so like a book, a journal article, something like that, or it could be an item, uh, but it's something that provides you with information regarding your research. So, you know, a painting, a piece of cloth, um, a, a great article from, you know, academia.edu, uh, all of these count as sources. But, not all sources are created equal. Some of them can be really good and helpful in the sense that maybe they get you started on some ideas and have great information um, as concepts, but maybe aren't something that you want to really cite as fact. Um, and so they're good to get you started. And that way we talked about how Pinterest and stuff can be really helpful early on, but you have to be more wary as you progress. Um, and some sources aren't really ever helpful. There's some stuff out there that is just full of wrongness. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways that we can help evaluate how useful a source is going to be and what purposes it can serve for you. So we're going to do a quick bit about types of sources, uh, specifically breaking them down to this dynamic of primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, a lot of uh, groups are moving away from this. In the MOAS work on the rubric, you'll often see we refer to it as primary slash direct uh, versus secondary slash analytical, because um, we find that can help. Also, no two libraries, uh, academic libraries, use the exact same definition. So there's a lot of fighting about what the exact perfect definition of these things are. are. So as a result, because this is contested, I am modeling my work in the handout and I have cited with um, the uh, definitions that I am using, you can find a, a footnote to the uh, citations for where I got those definitions. In general, a primary source or a direct source is something from the period that you are researching. A secondary source or an analytical source are later period are, are later period pieces which provide context and analysis. Uh, for a well developed, well researched, and well grounded project, ideally you're going to want a mix of both, because by having that mix of both, you're going to get a much more thorough understanding of a topic than you could get from looking at either option on its own. Uh, most SEA ANS competitions will expect you to have at least one primary source that you are referring to. Uh, so a primary source is a source that's created during the time period you're examining. So some examples would be like a shirt, a diary, a letter, a knife, a book. Um, and those would all be considered primary sources if they're from the time period you are looking at. Uh, some people get into a thing about, well, it's only a primary source if it's the same field that you are working in. So, for example, if you're making a textile, then it's only a primary source if you're citing, you know, another textile. If it's like a painting of a textile, that's a secondary source. Uh, I disagree because you know, the argument is, oh, well, a painting of it, it might not be a faithful representation. 
Uh, I disagree because I originally learned all of this from my history, my uh, history degree as an undergrad. And if you have ever looked at uh, descriptions written down, which is how we initially got these primary versus secondary, uh, mostly comes from uh, history um, classes in, or the history words, words going away. Again, I apologize. I'm on uh, medications that cause brain fog and I was hoping I could get through this class because I am much better at this, uh, that I'm much more comfortable uh, talking about research skills than most things, but uh, words aren't always showing up. But in general, in uh, history, you will often see an issue where we're working from written things such as a letter or a diary describing an event that took place, and that's how we get much of our information on some of these things. If you've ever uh, done an analysis of, say, the execution of Charles I is a classic one, because all the people who thought he was a good king are like, he was the most amazing, well put together, well spoken, noble sounding person as he went to his death with great aplomb. And all of the people who didn't like him and thought it was great he was executed was like, he was a coward, he was sniveling, he looked like he was about to fall over, he was so visibly weak, even though clearly both can't be accurate, uh, but we have letters from uh, people on both sides writing who claim to be at the same event, writing very dis uh, disparate accounts. So as a result, I tend to view it from that lens where we need to keep an eye on all of these primary sources that we look at because it, that can be an issue with any primary source. Um, a person may have written in the letter they saw it happen, but they might be lying, they might be mistaken. Sometimes we find out that the people who wrote these things down that worked their way into history books actually wrote them like 30 years later when they were on their deathbed. So like, sure, they were there, but when they actually wrote it down was way later. Um, Sadly, there's some really cool historical things like uh, Queen Elizabeth's speech of, I may have the, the body, uh, body of a woman, but I have the soul of lion, etc. Yeah, that's kind of from that similar thing of it was written down a long time after the fact. So you always want to keep an eye on those types of things. Likewise, a painting is not a photograph. Uh, it can show a very different visual from what actually existed. Uh, Frequently, you'll see debates in some of the various online, you know, Facebook groups for historic, different historical textiles of, well, I saw in this painting, and so I think that people were using speckle stitch because, you know, that creates this texture on, a, you know, that we see in this. And then someone with painting says, well, yes, it's a great way to add texture if you're using a paintbrush, but that doesn't mean that that's what it actually is. It's trying to show that there's some texture to it that might not mean that it actually is this little, you know, speckle stitch that we don't see any evidence in extant pieces or descriptions of in period. You have to really keep that in mind. Um, likewise, even extant garments, um, maybe it was ceremonial, maybe it definitely is from period, but it got cut apart and put back together in weird ways because it's been sit the reason we still have this piece that's from the 15th century is because it's in a sacred space and they have it dressing a holy statue um, and we have no idea how many um, changes that were made to it in order to make it fit the statue and how it was repaired in the meantime so it's always used to, you know, very important to when you look at these primary sources, uh, oh, and also sometimes museums, especially museums with um, a little less funding, um, things are just straight up mislabeled because when the item was given to them in the mid 1800s, they said, ah, yes, this is our family, you know, old smock that was originally worn by Mary, Queen of Scots and it, that label makes its way into the uh, museum description. Um, most major museums have been better about checking, finding out, well, actually, no, this is earlier or later, um, but it can vary, and sometimes things still are in there. Um, so always good to have a broad mix of multiple primary sources, as well as these secondary analytical sources, because that's what's going to give your research a broader base to be able to overcome any of these individual issues because by looking at what the scholars are writing, 
who have looked at these primary sources were able to get a, get a much better understanding of how these you know, potential issues ha could have been addressed in academia. Um, a quick uh, note, I've seen a lot of people freak out on the idea of, well, primary source is direct, you know, it's the ex actual extant thing, and then saying, well, how on earth does that mean that, like, if I can't fly to Italy, that I can't do, you know, use any primary sources? No, definitely not. You do not have to see the thing in person. Um, you might be, but we're looking at that item. So maybe you're looking at high res photographs of the item from a museum, uh, maybe a scanned copy uh, like the uh, Oxford, the Ashmolean Museum has a whole lot of um, in period texts that have been scanned and uploaded to the internet. Uh, and so those can count. Um, you also might have uh, details in an archaeological archaeological report that give a lot of information. Those can all let you reference a primary source uh, without you having seen it in person. So that's definitely not a limiting factor. Uh, a secondary source is a source that was created after the time period in question, but that discusses or analyzes the topic. Um, so many of these are going to be looking at multiple primary sources. Uh, others might just, you know, go super in-depth analyzing a single one. Um, there are some, depending on your definition, um, meta-analyses. Some people include that in secondary, some people bounce it otherwise. Um, but maybe who are looking at uh, a lot of different archaeological reports coming out or are looking at a lot of other um, scholarship and synthesizing some larger ideas from there. But in general, um, like journal articles, modern books um, are your, your big secondary or analytical sources that you would be using. Um, I do include the idea of a documentary in there. Um, but as a note, we'll get into more about this uh, when we talk about evaluating sources. Be very wary, even documentaries I've noticed have had a lot more questionable material added in um, than things that are written for a primarily academic audience. So the big advantage to these secondary sources or analytical sources is that they provide that analysis and context. Uh, so I have an example in here that a secondary source might tell you that a word like wool might mean something totally different in period than it does in modern English. So when I was first researching uh, for an Italian project, I found, you know, description of, oh, and they used uh, cotton wool. And I'm like, ooh, cotton wool. Is that like, you know, like a blend of cotton and wool? What is that? And going through and finally I realized, no, they just used wool because it's fluffy to kind of describe any um, textile that was in a very fluffy state um, and did not mean at all what I thought it meant. Uh, and so having these secondary analytical sources can be really useful for giving you that information about has the language shifted uh, in the time between when the letter that you have that you're referencing that was written in period, words ch uh, change over time, uh, does the language in it mean something very different to how we would interpret it now? This is really important when you're looking across uh, different languages uh, as well, because, um, and again, same thing, uh, modern Spanish can be very different from period Spanish, uh, but there's also a lot of false cognates, and so I've seen a lot of folks in the textiles realm run into issues uh, confusing words that look like maybe they're the same word, but have totally different meanings. Um, there was someone who uh, confused cambric, which is a type of cloth, with uh, camicia, which is the uh, Italian undergarment. And that gives a completely different understanding of, oh, and we have the source for black cambric. That means something completely different than assuming, you know, what it could be uh, mean in another way. So those secondary sources can be really, really useful in saying, okay, 
you might have looked at a lot of these extant pieces, but what have scholars in the field who studied this extensively and looked at a broad range, what are some things they've noticed? What is some background information that they have found? Uh, and find that uh, general information that can be incredibly valuable as you're researching. They're also really useful because they can often help give you more primary sources to work from. They might reference something that you can then go and find more information about, so they can be really useful for that as well. Uh, finally, much less commonly referenced, but I think it's useful to know, a uh, tertiary source is usually reference material which lists information and sources regarding a particular topic but without a lot of analysis. Uh, classic examples include encyclopedias and bibliographies. Some people call these bad sources in the sense that they don't necessarily cite primary sources directly. Um, I disagree. I think you can find a lot of useful information there if you understand the limitations of them, and it also can really vary. So if you're looking at an annotated bibliography, that's not going to be something that you'll necessarily cite as fact anywhere in your documentation but it's gonna be super useful in finding out, oh, hey, this person in doing an annotated bibliography um, of 16th century, whatever widgets, you know, research has a lot of great sources. I'm going to try to find those sources, track them down and read them and I'll learn from those. So it could be really useful for that. Uh, they can give overviews of general topics. So maybe your main project is in a certain field and you're trying to get a little bit of background information on something ta only tangentially related, maybe an encyclopedia would, uh, level of source might be useful for that. Um, that being said, be very careful. Anything labeled as encyclopedia, there's broad level of differences between um, ones that have a lot of well-grounded, well-cited work and ones that were put together probably by college students or people just out of college who are being paid uh, very low wages uh, in order to create something and kick it out there. Um, myself, when I was a grad assistant uh, in grad school, um, I wrote most of a chapter that went out um, on, on one of these types of things for $10 an hour. Uh, which is the deep secret to academia, which is be very careful about where you're getting these things. Um, also, this is why I'm very wary of textbooks, because this is very common with certain types of textbooks, and anything that goes super broad often hasn't cited and done the research for every little finicky um, bit of information. Uh, so, for example, there's like... Um, Encyclopedia of Western Textiles, I think, or English Textiles, something like that. But I was like, eh, that looks kind of sketch with the title, but we'll, we'll take a look. And because some people recommended it, I opened it up. Oh, every single entry has multiple references that you can use to follow up with and also shows that they've done their homework. Okay, that, that bodes really well for the quality. Um, and most of them even are signed by who, you know, what specific academic wrote that entry. I'm like, oh, very impressive. Meanwhile, some other encyclopedia, you're not nearly so well grounded. So they can be useful, but it's important to know how to use them and what limitations they have. All right, and then so getting more into evaluating sources is next. Do, any, do we have any questions before we get into that? We do. Um, so the first question, you touched on this a little bit, but we can probably go a bit deeper. Um, it's a question about sources in foreign languages. How should translations be treated and how would you go about analyzing a source in a foreign language for which you are unable to find a translation? Yeah, you just hit me with the easy questions there. Cool. Um, <laughs> so um, this is something I've run into myself because while I have a smattering of several languages, Italian is not one of them. And then I got really into Italian costuming. Um, so it also, I will say this is a point where in the SCA we differ from where what we do in academia. In academia, a lot of times if you're doing high level research, they really expect you to you know, go in and figure out and try to translate it yourself. 
Um, but that's also why like PhD programs and different things require you to be conversational in three to four languages. Um, that is not the expectation in uh, the SEA world. However, it is really important to make sure if you're using translated material that the person translating it, be it yourself or someone else, is skilled and has the background knowledge to be able to do so well. And if you're entering this for an ANS competition, uh, I would really say you want to be able to explain your reasoning for this to the judges. So for example, if I'm looking at um, a text uh, in translation, um, for example, uh, one that I used a lot that is a modern scholar who translated a lot of stuff and then wrote up bits of it uh, in his own books is Frick. He wrote Dressing Renaissance Florence, really great book. He has an expert, he is an expert in Italian fashion. He is an academic publishing very well meticulously researched stuff. Uh, his understanding of period Italian is going to be vastly better than my own. And again, he's a scholar in the field. Uh, my partner, Daroga, does historical fencing, and he does Spanish historical fencing, and he does not, is not an expert in historical Spanish. And what's really interesting is seeing some of the debates by different people publishing modern translations, and some of them are um, much better received and supported than others, and it can dramatically influence how we read the material. Um, the, there's actually, there was a great entry at this past ANS champs, which was reading, uh, not by, by, by Daroga, done by someone else, uh, of reading two different translations of a historic fencing manual and how the differences in translation change the understanding that you take away from it. So it's really important to be aware of. The big things that I would look for uh, for evaluating translated material are what are the qualifications of the person who did the translation? So are they an academic and specifically an academic in that area? Like I'm an academic mundanely, but my area is in modern pedagogy. My area of expertise, you know, as a hobbyist is textiles, but I wouldn't try to claim that that makes me, you know, a Monday, you know, that I am an expert in them. Um, so you, you should take what I say with much more of a grain of salt than if I had a PhD in historic textiles. Uh, so likewise is um, if they're not an academic, you know, many people are doing great work outside of academia. Um, do they speak the language, uh, the, the modern language well? How much work have they done understanding the period uh, language versus the modern? Um, how much work have they done if it's looking at specific areas like fencing or textiles? How much work have they done into understanding the period terms and how they'd be different? Um, and there's some great modern uh, translators out there, uh, some working related to the SCA, but they show their work. And so that gives you, as uh, someone who's using this, you can say when you're, um, if you're entering ANS champs, one of the things under sources is um, the applicability of the source, the quality of the source, uh, those are in our rubric. And so it actually gives the artisan a prompt to talk about who's this person that they're citing uh, and how skilled are they in this area, it gives you the opportunity to really talk to the judges and say, hey, this is, you know, this person um, has been published in these hobbyist, you know, articles, uh, they have this background, they have these qualifications, those can all really influence um, what we think of it. Uh, also, reviews. Um, what have other people said about the work? Have, and maybe that's even just looking on Amazon. If someone's self-publishing through Amazon, what's interesting is seeing commentary. That's, that shows up even there. Uh, obviously, if there are options on JSTOR and formal academic uh, book reviews, that's great. But you can get a lot just from how is this being spoken about um, in the community it's being published in, whatever community that is. Um, I, I definitely would not expect you to 
you know, be able to speak whatever language the area your topic is in. Uh, I do think it's useful to know some of the major words that pop up. I think that would be very helpful for you doing research. Um, if there's a source in a foreign language and you can't find a translation, I run into that myself. I tried doing it through Google Translate. It was not good. But then I asked in uh, a Facebook group for the topic because it was a uh, Norwegian source. And I'm like, I don't know anything about Norwegian, nor do I know anyone who speaks Norwegian. And funny enough, there happened to be some people who were super into early period textiles who were from, you know, who speak Norwegian, you know, as their native language, who were happy to actually jump on and break some things down and be like, okay, so the museum is saying this, 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 and this. It was, uh, it was an old um, museum catalog listing and it was very confusing. Google Translate did not understand it to s save its life. Um, but so I was able to find some help that way. And there are lots of different options. And sometimes if you just can't get access to that source, you can't and you have to find other things. And there's a lot of other options out there. Uh, no, but you know, not speaking a foreign language should never stop you from being able to score well uh, or show a good ANS project if you put in the legwork and are willing to look for alternatives. So we have another question, um, but also just to give Google Translate a little bit more love, um, for some things I've used it for, it's worked pretty well, but those have been very technical things, grave finds, descriptions of a museum item, uh, not from some old catalog. So the language I think was easier to read. So I think a short little excerpts like that, like from an archeological report in another language, if you know what grave you want, you might be able to, to get some things like that or from, from a website blurb. But it has to be taken, I think, with a, with a grain of salt. And the idea I just wanna emphasize of knowing some of the important words in the other language. Um, for me, I do glass beads. So knowing how um, the, the Norse say the word glass and glass bead, for example, allows me to search some Norwegian um, websites for artifacts and finds. So that can be really helpful too as a way to research. I'm gonna add one other giant caveat about Google Translate. Um, it's fantastic for things that are meant literally. If you're working in literature, especially poetry, stay away from Google Translate, please. <laughs> so yeah, I still remember when I had tried, I've also found it seemed to work much better for Italian than it had for some other languages, but I also, I don't speak Italian, but I speak French-ish. Um, so I was able to sort of hack my way through, but I got stuck at one point when I'm looking at this description and it's like, and the hedgehog was very much appreciated and loved in this, and I'm like, that can't be right. And they said, and they made a dress of hedgehogs. And I'm like, that, that absolutely cannot be right. Turns out the word for hedgehog is the same as the word um, for uncut spiky velvet. It's a technical, because, you know, it's a technical, yeah. Um, but so, you know. Yeah. Always give it a shot. You never know. You might find something interesting. And if nothing else, you might find a funny story. So the um, next question we have is somebody who's asking about, and you, you may want to address this later, but asking about more sort of SCA related sources. Um, the CA, Creative Anachronist, but what about websites, blogs? Uh, oh, um, so we will get into that in the section right, uh, um, right here. Okay. Um, uh, we'll get into it in like five minutes because that's in the next uh, part, but that is part of this next section. Uh, and so we will follow up with that there. Uh, anything else? No, we're good to go. All right, perfect. All right, so um, how to evaluate sources. Uh, when looking at books and journal articles, the big things that I first look at are uh, the date published. Part of this is because there's a lot of new stuff that's been done, uh, especially with the rise of the internet. Researchers are able to share things way faster and more broadly than they used to. Um, technology is allowing us to do uh, like spectrographic analysis on extant items to a hugely more uh, great detail level of detail than was before. 
also, there is so much information that was caused by the Victorians. Uh, in their defense, they were trying to create like fields of research and figure this stuff up out, but unfortunately, they had a tendency to look at things like paintings or you know bits of finds and extrapolate pretty wildly and then just decide that that is clearly fact and we will write it down in all of the books uh, that that is how things are and that was how that was created and this is how they work. Um, and it really took to about the 1960s before all of that kind of worked its way out. There's still frankly some of it that still kicks in uh, in certain fields. Um, but I look at anything pre-1960 pretty sketch. Um, if, you're, if the only sources you can find are older or the only sources that you find that say the things you, you know, agree with and think sound right are older, I would definitely be wary and try to see what's going on in academia more modernly. Ideally, at least some of them in, from the past like 10 to 20 years. Um, just because there have been some very dramatic shifts in understanding uh, that's not to say that you can't use anything from from that date. Uh, there's a great tablet weaving source from, I forget if it's the late 50s or the early 60s, um, that's still widely cited because it's one step away from an archaeological report. It was a person who was able to get permission to go into the finds at Westman, uh, into the um, rolls and grants, the all of the old uh, texts of bills and trusts and things uh, from parliament uh, that date back, you know, this one was looking specifically at work from the 1200s, and they got permission to go in and analyze a lot of the tablet woven seal tags from the 1200s. And not many people have been given that access. And the person went in, took some, you know, pretty decent photos considering the date, and meticulously recorded the width, um, the techniques used, et cetera. And so, you know, that's very, there's not a lot of guessing there. There's not a lot of analysis that's not analyzing the works in front of them. And so that maybe, you know, is a, a lot more useful than someone writing a more broad, here's what we understand about tablet weaving in general in the Middle Ages. I might be a little more suspect uh, and want to find out, hey, have we learned anything to the contrary since? Um, my partner, Daroga, I'm going to throw under the bus again. Uh, when he was first starting out, he had this uh, theory and he was really excited. He thought it sounded very good. And he found this book that was published by someone who it described itself as being an expert uh, in Spanish history. And it said exactly what he was hoping. And then he looked at that and went, ah, nothing else has said what I was hoping, and that does. That's suspicious. And brought it to me, and we did some searching together, and we found out that this guy who was a self-described expert in it was actually a glorified travel writer and had no historical experience whatsoever and seemed to have just made up a lot of stuff. Uh, so it's really good to sort of check out reviews online um, see if people comment that, oh, hey, there's some issues in it, or are the people who are publishing stuff, you know, in the last five years still quoting this person? That might heavily influence um, how that date published, might, uh, if uh, that might influence if you want to use it or not, but it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and again, that is something for a project that you were looking to have score really well, I'd want to see, you know, at least a mix of some of these newer texts. I'd really like to see uh, at least a rough idea of what's going on in the more modern scholarly community on this topic, just because so many changes have, have happened. So if you have some older stuff, totally cool, but try to find maybe an article to, uh, that's more modern to mix in with it as well. Another thing that I would look at is the publisher. Um, this isn't to say that there are, in fact, uh, a lot of well-researched and very well-documented books that have been self-published um, or published through, you know, non-academic companies. 
Um, there's so, some genuinely great stuff, especially in some of these fields where they're not hugely broadly popular outside of like different reenactor communities. Um, that often makes it harder for things to get published in uh, for university presses. Uh, and so there are a lot of great scholars doing self-published work, but that's really grounded uh, with good citations. But if that's the case, you just need to do a little more work if you're not uh, to, to check those things. So if you're not sure, a university press or an academic journal can be a much safer bet. So if it's Cambridge University Press, I'm probably not going to do that ton of work. You know, if it's Cambridge University Press from the last 20 to 40 years, I'm probably not going to bother to worry too much about it, especially again, because it's going to be mixed in with a bunch of other sources who probably will talk shade about them in at least one of them um, if they disagree with an author who was published in something popular. Uh, and I'll probably find out about it that way. Uh, so if, if you're not sure, Focusing on those academic journals and things from university or college press uh, definitely makes it a little easier. Um, they're usually held to a higher standard for documentation and research. If like Penguin Books publishes something and it turns out, oh, hey, you know, there's some historical inaccuracies. Eh, eh. How much are people going to get upset? If Oxford University Press does it, well, they have a bit more of, of uh, they, they want to be a little more careful about that. Again, though, when in doubt, looking up reviews of the work online and seeing what people are saying about it, it can be super useful. Um, also, again, for any of these, post to if there's a Facebook group that has a lot on this topic, um, like there's some, you know, 15th century costuming group, or there's, there's so many different Facebook groups, it's a really great resource. Um, just posting in theirs and saying, hey, I saw this uh, source or this book, what do people think about it? Might give you some ideas about, you know, if there's any controversy to them. Uh, going forward, another thing to look at, the topic. So the big thing that so often comes up is if the purpose of the book or the article or the text is to teach a craft to a modern audience, be super, super wary of any statements it makes about the historic use of the craft. The number of times people have come on, you know, to the various groups saying, well, I'm sure that this technique must be period because my 1970s crafting book of, you know, this technique is easy and fun, said so with no citations whatsoever in the whole thing. It, they often like to claim that techniques, this dates back to the Elizabethan period. I'm like, really? Do you have any evidence for that? Or did you just think it would sell more craft books or you thought it sounded cool or you, you know, your focus is on teaching the craft, not on the research. And as a result, you just went with, you know, whatever the general idea you had of the topic was. Um, these types of books might be great for learning a technique, but they very frequently contain serious errors regarding historic usage. Uh, so trying to use texts that are focused on an academic subject of some sort, um, but also looking at ones that cite multiple extant examples to go along with their claims uh, can be really useful to help sort of check in there, uh, or ones that are targeted towards researchers. I, I spoke briefly before about the issue with documentaries. Um, some documentaries are much more grounded in fact than others, especially there's a lot of modern stuff. I mean, we have all the memes about the History Channel and aliens, uh, but, but that's a bit of a problem. Is the piece being designed for a primarily academic audience that's looking to share information? Or is it much more entertainment with a historical flair? those are going to have two different levels of accuracy in how well they have checked all of the facts that they're about to make. Um, so I'd be very, very wary, um, even if it's produced by the History Channel or, or something else. Um, I've even caught quite a few things, like I love the BBC shows on historical stuff. If Lucy Worsley's made it, I've probably seen it. Um, but every so often they say something in one of them and I'm like, that is super wrong. Come on, guys, you're better than this. Um, so always good. It can be useful, but 
we might want to double check things that you see in those areas. Um, finally, uh, and this we touched on briefly in some of these other elements, but I think it deserves its own citation use. If the text is full of formal citations, and you know when they make big claims, they have references either formally or otherwise, but they say like, oh, here is this piece from this museum from this time period showing this technique in use. Well, okay, that, that's some pretty strong evidence there. You can always go and verify that yourself and make sure that that's dated correctly, you know, that that is in fact what the museum says it is, uh, and that is present where they say it is, but that bodes pretty well. Um, if they have an entire book with, you know, no direct references, you know, that, that really show their work, well, that you might want to be a little more wary of it. Uh, again, my big thing is there's sometimes some stuff that I look at, again, there's a lot of his, um, textbooks on historical costuming that have a lot of questionable ideas. Um, I think Margaret Scott is one of them um, that I found this specific piece in where it's like, oh, and this type of textile was often made using velvet. And I'm like, really? In the 12th century? For like middle class? That's, that's high. Um, and I'm looking through and I'm like, they don't have any citations. They have citations for a lot of other stuff. They don't have any citations for that at all. So I'm going to use this source to give me some ideas about things and maybe find some references I wouldn't have otherwise found, but I'm going to follow up on statements that they make and, and double check them. Uh, and so citations, very, very useful things to look for. Um, and now this is getting closer to that question we are asked for, we're, we're in that direction, websites. Um, and I say here in the handout, oh, books and journals are excellent, and there are many online options too. I'll be honest, I haven't used a paper journal in like 10 years. Um, realistically, I get all of my journals online, but they are technically published in a paper journal, and, uh, and I'm accessing the online version. But realistically, it, you don't have to feel like you have to go to some place in person. There are so many great scholarly works that are available online. Um, those are really the way to go in, in practice. That's where all of my scholarly articles come from. Uh, but getting back to this, uh, some good sources, museum websites. A lot of museums have their full catalogs or partial catalogs listed online and you can just page through when they have high resolution photos. Sometimes they're also super chill. Um, I at one point emailed, this was a while ago, I think they now charge for it, because uh, this was like close to 10 years ago, but I e emailed the VNA uh, and was like, hi, so I like doing this thing. Um, all of the photos of this item are only of the front. Any chance you could get a photo of the back? And the person who worked there responded back with, yeah, I snapped a couple on my phone uh, and uploaded them here. Um, if you need better quality, we can do that, but it costs money to get the photographer. Hope this helps. And like that's the Victoria and Albert Museum is really awesome. I love them. They're very friendly. Again, I do think they now charge for custom photos, uh, but in general, they've been very, very lovely and responsive. Uh, and I believe other people have said the same. Certain museums are more friendly than others with regards to asking follow-up questions, uh, but a lot of them are very excited to, to help provide extra information even or additional photos um, if needed. And if, but in general, so much useful information for extant items can be found on museum websites. And those all do count as primary sources. Uh, additionally, university libraries. Some universities have large parts of their, you know, collection that, you know, predates copyright. They've just posted available online, and that often includes scanned copies of extant works. Sometimes there's limits on how you can use it, like you're allowed to use it for your own notes, but you're not allowed to take images from it and share them elsewhere uh, for in, in public forums. Um, but they at least have those options online. Again, um, the Ashmolean um, has a, are part of a, 
Oxford has large amounts of things that are totally scanned in. I'm pretty sure that's where I got um, uh, images from the Luttrell Psalter uh, for looking at text, you know, versions of textiles uh, or painted renditions of them at least. And they're just online and anyone can access them for free. Um, Project Gutenberg or Google Books, uh, there's both et things that are from period, like um, memoirs, diaries, some of them they've just scanned in the extant stuff and posted them and you can just read them. Um, there are also uh, some scholarly, uh, more modern pieces are on there. Sometimes you can get sections of modern books that are in copyright, but they'll let you read like a chapter or like 20 pages or 25 or whatever for free, which is super useful. If you only need like one chapter, there's quite a few books that I found on Google Books and was able to get everything I needed just from the free preview. Because I am very cheap and don't spend money if I can possibly avoid it. Uh, so they can be very useful. Um, also, there's a lot of academic journals that are published online and uh, often are sometimes freely accessible. A big one for textiles people, I apologize, I'm so focused on textiles. I'm a textiles person, so that's where most of my um, examples come from. Um, uh, but uh, experimental, uh, Sorry, again, the lack of words is very frustrating. And um, there's a historical textiles, uh, archeological textiles journal, which name escapes me currently, um, but it has their premium thing that you have to pay for, gives you the newer ones, but after a few years, all of their back stuff uh, shows up after it's been in print for I think like five years or even less. Um, and so that makes it much, much, you, know, you can look through all of these things about um, extant archaeological finds that have textiles and writings on them, and you can find them all for free, even though they're a good scholarly journal, they're totally free to access, you just, you know, don't get the most recent ones uh, unless you pay. So, and there's a lot of great free resources out there that are of that level. Uh, and again, further on, as noted in the handout on page five, we have a whole bunch of different ways to access academic journals for no money. Um, unfortunately, not all line sources can be taken as fact. Uh, newspapers, uh, they kill me sometimes. The, there was a big thing when Richard III's grave was found a while ago under a parking lot in England and all of these journalists wrote about it and some of them got things very wrong because they're journalists, they're not academics, it's, that's not their primary job and focus. Um, and uh, in the same way where we, we all know about the issues where, okay, scientists do this experiment, find this small finding, the press release goes out, news articles pick it up and take it in a totally different direction, that same thing can happen for history. So if you're, you know, if like the New York Times wrote some sort of thing that touched on this topic, probably not the source you want to use for that. Uh, and getting back to the question that was asked before, personal websites, which I'm also going to drop in SEA research, uh, other SEA research is a similar topic. There's a lot of really wonderful SEA and mundane researchers who've published their work online. So if you take an idea from their site, like, oh, hey, I'm using a um, adapted recipe that, uh, you know, mistress so-and-so looked at the period recipe and adapted it, and I'm using their adaptation, you definitely want to cite it to show that it wasn't your own idea to avoid plagiarism, but you're not citing, it's important to not cite that as fact because, you know, Mistress, what's her name, might be awesome and amazing, but she also might have been very wrong. And so there's a difference between saying, hey, I got this idea or this inspiration from someone else versus saying, I am counting this person's uh, ideas as a fact on the same level of like a scholar, of what a scholar would say. Um, there's a lot of us who've done a lot, you know, so myself, 
I'm a, I'm a mistress, I'm a Laurel. I'm also the deputy ANS minister. I was also super wrong about a bunch of things in some of my ANS documentation that I now look back on and I'm like, that, that was wrong. Uh, I don't really want to go back and change it all because that would be kind of weird and I think it's important to show how I, I learned and went through stuff. But, well, Mr. Selena said to do it this way, don't, do not cite me like that. Um, I am not a scholar, as I've said before. Um, there's some great SCA researchers who've done really wonderful work, but I really would not, it, it's not gone through any sort of, oh, the next section we talk about peer review, and that's kind of a part of a big process of this. Anyone can write their SCA documentation and they post it, and there's not a formal process by which we give feedback and say, okay, well, I agree with this, but you know, here's this issue. Um, in academia, if you're a scholar and you write a book and people think you're wrong, they can do a book review that's also published in JSTOR, which is, a, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, a big repository of different bits of information uh, in the scholarly world, everything from articles, book reviews, um, abstracts, etc. Uh, and you can go and you can publish your review of their book saying, this book is super wrong and has much wrongness to it. Don't believe a word out of this person's mouth. Um, and, and that sort of helps this whole process. There's not really a formal way of doing that for SCA work. Uh, and again, as Laurel myself, just because Laurel said it does not mean it is true. In fact, a lot of things Laurels have said in the past, we again, Things have changed. Research has improved. Stuff that we knew as fact 10 to 15 years ago has been totally misproven. So it, it just is not a good option. Um, I mean, you all, everyone gets to make their own choices for this, but for myself as a judge in an ANS competition, if I saw someone citing someone else's SCA documentation as fact, I would, you know, that would be counted against them. We don't consider that to be a scholarly level article. Um, one caveat is if it's the personal website of, an, of a scholarly academic, like they have their PhD in it, but they're currently between universities, okay, that's different. But when we're talking about like general personal websites, even if it's a very impressive sounding URL, again, you can publish anything on the internet and no one fact checks it. So unless there's a official fact checking part of the process, I think one of the uh, comments initially said complete anachronist, um, that is an SCA publication, but what's interesting is that they do have a peer review process where if you want to submit to that, it goes out to several people who are considered experts in that field and they do a review of the information in it. That kind of changes that from this, oh, well, I wrote it and I put it on the internet uh, to, okay, I wrote it and it went through that review process. Um, but no, even if someone's a Laurel, even if someone is well-respected, um, use their stuff as inspiration, check out what sources they're using. But I would really recommend if you're looking to ground your work in scholarly data, you have to do the research yourself to look at those scholarly works. Otherwise, it's just never going to be a solid, well-grounded foundation that you need in order to build uh, a well-researched uh, piece and to have a broad understanding and a solid understanding of your topic. So we, we really do need to reinvent the wheel every time. No, uh, I would, I would no. Okay. So use, again, you're not reinventing the wheel. It's important because when you're looking at my documentation, you're not getting all of what Frick said on this topic. You're not getting all of what any other expert said on this topic. You're getting my very brief snippets. And those snippets, maybe they're taken out of context. Um, maybe I played a little fast and loose. I have never done that. I have very firm things about um, plagiarism and academic dishonesty. But I've seen people, and I hope most of the time it's accidental, um, who have cited things and I'm like, I have read that source. That source says exactly the opposite of what you're saying it said. 
And so it's really important. You can use that source. You, know, you can use that person's documentation, but look at what they've written, look at their ideas and look at the sources they used and then go back and check those sources yourself maybe you will have a completely different interpretation. Maybe they had some pretty serious flaws um, that only finding those bits and pieces uh, uh, that they pulled out, it wasn't visible. Uh, and again, there literally was a time when I saw someone cite um, an extent or, or cite a, a scholar on a topic and I'm like, I am incredibly familiar with that source. I have, I've used that source myself. That source says exactly the opposite. And sure enough, they had missed a knot. And when they retyped it themselves, they missed it. I don't think it was intentional, but it dramatically, you know, it completely reverses their argument. And that's really important. And so that's why, like, definitely you can use that as an inspiration and a jumping off point. It's vastly easier to get started if you have someone else's work to guide you to what some good sources are, to what some existing extant items are. You know, those can all be really useful. But if you're just looking at their documentation, it's kind of the same thing of like, oh, well, I have a screenshot of a photo, you know, that was Xeroxed once, every time it gets copied, you can lose a little bit of that clarity. And it's really important to go back and double check that, yeah, no, okay, I checked, that looks good, that's fine. And again, myself, I'm a Laurel, I've been wrong about things. I'm gonna throw Alyssa under the bus, she's a Laurel, she's been wrong about things. Like, there, there's a whole collection of misinformation in the SCA, mostly perpetuated accidentally. Um, I've also seen it happens where, you know, Laurel so-and-so gives a class and says, I found this is an easy way to do this thing. And someone takes that class and then turns around and says, Laurel so-and-so says this is the only way to do this thing. Just, you always want to go back to the source where you found it. You want to go back to, you know, to try to track down where that information came from, who said it, where did they get it from, and double check that, because that's how we avoid things like pink didn't exist in period, and um, all, uh, all SCA period uh, women's clothing uh, should be offset spiral laced. That was a personal thing of mine where I looked at over 5,000 paintings to find a hundred paintings of women's clothing showing a specific thing to do a data analysis showing that that is an SCA myth and it's super wrong. I, I've done that with the bodice doesn't match the skirt thing. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's a lot of these types of things. And so the SCA has lots and lots of, uh, cool and, and great researchers doing amazing work, definitely use that, but understand the limitations of that as well. Thank you. Mm, you got it. Um, I, I missed who asked the initial question. Did that answer? Okay, was, all right, perfect. Um, we're gonna briefly follow up a little more. I think, actually, I think I covered all of this. I have a section of the handout talking more detailed about peer review, but really what it comes down to is the reason we make that disconnect is the SCA doesn't really have this process of peer review for most of our work versus academia has these types of either official peer review where if you want to submit to a journal, it has to go out to a collection of people um, or the unofficial one, which is if you write a book and there's, you're wrong, a lot of people do book, um, book reviews saying you're super, super wrong. Um, my, I have two master's degrees, uh, and one of them is in English, and my master's thesis for English, funny enough, one of the books I used has the most hilarious disparity of the, um, of the reviews, because it was a very contentious topic, and so the person wrote the, uh, the book, and then half the reviews are like, this is a great book that explains things and it speaks the truth. And half the book reviews are, this person is a hack and should lose their academic credentials. They are so wrong. Uh, so uh, it is, and uh, sometimes unknown, but really hysterical when you get into it. Part of academia is this peer review process that really makes a difference into how it pushes things to, to move forward uh, with, with accuracy. Oh yes, please. For the creative anachronist, while they do have a peer review process, I think most of their peer review 
does come from within the SCA. Um, so again, for something like the Creative Anachronist, I would use it to get information and to mine their sources, but I would want in any project to see somebody go beyond the Creative Anachronist and to chase down some of those sources. And again, you should never be using just a single source ever. So maybe you use the, uh, the Creative Anachronist but then you also go through its sources and then you also find some more of your own on top of that and that builds that solid foundation. You know, anytime you're trying to hinge your entire project on a single source, that's very wobbly, likely to fall over. I'm just gonna continue the metaphor because it works. All right, uh, any questions before we move on to where to find these things? No additional questions from the chat. Excellent. All right. Uh, yeah. Just to let you know. And if you get stuck in the footnotes, then trying to hit page down won't help you. All right. Oh, sorry. What were you saying, Lissa? Just to let you know, it's 821. Shoot. We are. I, wow, we are. All right, I'm gonna go faster. Uh, again, I apologize. I have taught this class repeatedly and I've always been able to do it in an hour and a half and I am on a lot of medications that's heavily influencing things, I apologize. So um, there's a bunch of links here under where can I find good research slash sources uh, for various um, things that uh, have free options. Uh, one caveat, academia.edu is great, but in recent years, people have started posting it was originally designed for academics to post their work uh, in a free format. Um, people have realized you can just upload whatever you want there. No one's vetting it and have started uploading even like I've seen people upload their SCA documentation there. So be wary, double check. Uh, Academia.edu has a lot of great stuff on there for free, but um, double check what uh, article, uh, what journal it was originally published in. Um, but there's a large collection there of different free resources, uh, including, I saw a note in the chat as well, uh, JSTOR, it does technically cost money if you want the full version. However, in non-COVID times, uh, if you create an account for free, they'll let you access six articles per month uh, without any charge. Uh, and during COVID times, they have upped it to, I think, 100. So they, there are really great options there for finding a lot of great scholarly stuff for free. Um, also check out your local libraries. Um, also uh, a lot of local public libraries are connected with local public universities. Um, my university library that I work at is also connected to my public library and any local person who lives in my town or any of the towns in this area um, has access to, I think, 13 different university libraries because they all happen to be in this north of Boston group. Um, and they will freely take it from the university library and ship it to the local public library all for free to you. So take a look at your local public library and see what options they have. Also local university libraries, even if you've never attended, uh, most of them are pretty chill about people coming in and using some of their resources, some less so than others. When in doubt, call ahead. Um, moving on from there, uh, there's a question that comes up a lot of how many sources do I need? And I have a whole blog post written on the handout on this, but what it comes down to is there's no one exact answer. It's really going to depend on the depth of your topic, how much research has already been done on it, um, what, you know, what are your goals of the project, and how much are you going against popular opinion with it? Um, but the, you know, the fake, not, a, not an answer, but probably a decent one is uh, the more sources you can get, the better. If you're looking for something that's going to have a really solid foundation, you're probably going to want to, uh, to be looking at a, at least some number of combination, um, but substantially more than one of extant you know, pieces and uh, things from period, and uh, at least several uh, relatively recent Prime, uh, secondary sources as well. If you're looking to score very well, 
you're going to want to do more research to have a broader uh, understanding and, and that shows. Also, not everything that you look at is going to necessarily be a good fit. Um, like sometimes you'll read through a, whole, uh, a bunch and it just does not end up uh, being a uh, part of your project. So you often have to do more research than uh, gets into your final version of your documentation. Uh, that being said, those extra sources might be a painting you found on Pinterest after you double checked that, okay, it really is from the Met. All right, I'll now go to the Met's website and get the information from there. Um, if you don't have to read the whole book, you just have to read the part of the chapter that has to do with your topic. Um, so a lot of sources you might be able to find and use pretty fast. Uh, it can often sound a lot more intimidating than it is. And again, double check that, that first page in a book for breaking down the chapters and seeing, do you really need the whole book or do you really only need like one or a few chapters? All right, so going on from there, we are definitely going to run over past the 830 mark. I apologize. I should have been paying much more attention. Um, but in general, some advice on how to document or write up your research. Always start with the research before you start crafting. The number of times I've seen people run into issues because they do what's called backwards document. So you make the thing and then you try to document it. And there are often many issues. Um, a big one has to do with um, the popular advice for what materials or methods you should use turns out to not be true. Um, so you always want to start with the research first and then do the crafting because a lot of things might dramatically change as you go through. You don't have to have it like all typed up, you know, pretty and neat, but you at least need to know the general ideas. Uh, additionally, Document as you go. If you're doing a big project, it's going to take, you know, multiple weeks or even months as you go through, you know, slowly adding information. If you type up your notes and your citations as you go, it is dramatically, dramatically easier to pull the whole project together uh, than if you do all the research and then at the go to write it all up and they're like, well, I know one of these five books had a quote somewhere talking about this, uh, this use of materials. It, that's miserable. I'm a very lazy person, so I always like to do the least amount of effort to succeed at the thing I want to do. So I hate having to go back and reread things. So uh, I usually create a Google Doc that breaks down like use in period, materials, construction techniques, miscellaneous or otherwise. You could also use the rubric and use those as elements. And then I just type up little bits of notes. And I don't do the full, like, properly formatted citation. I'll literally do, um, I have an example in the handout. So Johnston, page 61, red was a favorite color for widgets. So, you know, and several more examples, uh, maybe along with some commentary, makes it much, much easier to go through and pull that information. I know exactly where to go to find the full quote. You know, sometimes I'll have the full quote pulled out already. I'll type the whole thing out so I don't have to go back to it. Definitely, definitely take notes as you go. Um, also, if you're using printed out things from journal articles, highlighters are your friends. Um, if you're not, if you're working with books, um, sticky notes, uh, I usually straight up just take a sticky note and I cut it into little tiny tabs because I'm cheap and I don't want to have to buy the pre-made ones. Uh, and I flag them if I'm doing a super intense project, I'll even like color code the flagging system, figure out what works for you, but Making it easy to find where that information is dramatically uh, improves your process. Um, I have some ideas here on formatting your research, which effectively comes down to there's no one way. You can break it down whatever way works great for you. Some people do more of a story method of like, here's how I went on my process of learning this. Some people break it down more by category. Um, if you're uh, used in a kingdom like the East that has a rubric, you can just straight up use the rubric categories as your headings and break it down that way. Um, you might not even end up wanting to do written documentation. You might end up wanting to do verbal. That sounds utterly terrifying to me. Uh, I, I'm mostly reading off of this and I'm a professional teacher who normally would never do that. Uh, because just that, even still, that sounds utterly terrifying. But for some people that seem, uh, that's gonna be an easier fit. Um, but figure out how for your documentation, what makes sense to you, what can you do easily, um, but any sort of organization that lets the people reading it or evaluating it uh, or learning from it 
be able to easily understand the concepts that you're talking about. If that works, it's cool. Uh, figure out what works for you. Look at some examples if you can. Always useful. Um, but again, I'm really big into, uh, I'm a boring person. I'm like, intro, materials, methods, and I do little subheadings so you can easily jump between them. Um, finally, a quick note on that subject, uh, revising your research. Nothing is ever going to be perfect on the first round. So like the first time you enter it, uh, I always, when I was doing competitions, I like to enter things a few months in advance at some smaller ANS, you know, competitions so I could get advice on like, hey, you don't really explain this super well, or you say this thing, but there's not really a lot of citations to back it up, even though I have them, I just forgot to put them in. Um, or people say, hey, you think this thing turns out that's very wrong and here's my proof. And I went, oh, cool. Thank you. Now I know I can make things better. Um, so taking that time to seeing as uh, iterative of, okay, this is this version of this, but I can improve from there. And maybe that improvement is I tweak my documentation for this project and I enter it again. Maybe, you know, that means, okay, this project I learned a lot from. My next project on this topic, I will be able to use all this information that I've learned. Um, but ANS is never like a, a single, oh, and this is what you are. Uh, it is always an evolving process. And this can be really helpful to keep in mind if you enter an ANS competition, um, nothing is set in stone. It's just a reflection of that day. You can always um, take what you learn and use it to improve things going forward. Um, all right, I'm just gonna hold questions till the end to get into them then. Um, next, we're getting into some citations information. Um, for the East, we don't require that you ha use any specific style, um, just that we can vet them. So you need to provide enough information that someone looking who reads your documentation, especially a judge, would be able to find the source and find where in the source you're talking about it. Um, but we're very flexible on format. However, there are three very common um, source types uh, of citation, uh, MLA, Modern Language Association, uh, APA, uh, and Chicago. And you can find how to cite if you want to do very formal uh, citations. Um, the trick that we use in the academic world is you don't bother learning it yourself, you cheat, you go to OWL, uh, Purdue OWL, which is short for Online Writing Lab, and you look at their examples and you just do it that way because, you know, memorizing MLA for how to do, you know, a translated edited copy where you're only looking at one chapter is exhausting and that's what the internet's for. Um, so. If you, if you want to try one of those format styles, check out Purdue OWL um, as a reference in the handout and literally just Google Purdue OWL. Um, quick note, however, um, different citation styles definitely do work better in different formats. Um, when I do websites, I do everything in MLA because all of the citations are what's called uh, in text uh, rather than in a footnote. Um, and so as you're scrolling, don't have to go from the middle of the page down to the bottom and back up. When I'm doing papers, I like Chicago. It's a personal preference. Um, I like being able to immediately see if you say, oh, Smith says that widgets were definitely red. Okay, well, is Smith uh, someone from Oxford or is Smith the guy who wrote making widgets is easy and fun? I like knowing that because I'm a very suspicious person. So I like knowing that as I go through and not having to flip to the end, um, but it's entirely personal preference. Um, additionally, a quick note about sources as well for any citation style is you can do um, full citations of, uh, or, or sorry, uh, quotations. So I have an example here, widgets of the 14th century were, quote, covered in gold, silver, and jewels, quote, Smith, page 98. But you don't always need to have it in quotation marks if you're just stating like a fact that you got from there. Uh, you can just go 14th century widgets were heavily decorated with precious metals and gems, Smith 98. Um, I usually hold out and use quotations mostly if it's like something super firm, super pushy, or super snarky, because I like it when academics are snarky with each other. 
Uh, and in the handout, you can see examples of the three most common styles uh, and a little bit more about why you might want to pick one versus another, uh, as well as a little bit more going into quoting versus paraphrasing. Um, in general, if the original quote is super long, unless it's really important, really look in and maybe paraphrase. Um, and just it's easier for everyone than having to read through a whole long section. You can also use, you know, dot, 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 if it's like, oh, well, here's the part that's important, and then there's like five lines that aren't, and then here's this other part, just cut those and do the dot, dot, dot. Um, finally, another recommendation, as I said above, check out research support in your community. Like, these are all formal options for conducting your research. Uh, and putting together your documentation, but there are tons of options out there. Again, in the East, we have the MOAS office, lots of other kingdoms. You can always check out their MOAS office. Uh, there's lots of different online groups that are inter-kingdom that provide support. Uh, I link a few different groups um, at the bottom here, and then we are all caught up. I have some links there uh, for finding your local SEA kingdom to find your local ANS minister. Um, I have some Facebook group pages for uh, um, different general groups, so uh, artisans, um, the Library of Alexandria, which is a bunch of people just asking research questions and showing, uh, and etc. And finally, I'm bringing, going to bring us back to uh, our final thought. ANS is something we do for fun, so don't stress or panic. Uh, pick your topic, find some sources on it, write up what you've got, and ask for help along the way at any step of that process. Um, anyone can learn to create good scholarly documentation that is well-researched and well-supported. Anyone can learn and study um, to really become an expert in their field and progress in an ANS path. Um, Every little bit of research and experience you get is a step in the right direction. And if there's anything we in the MOAS office can do to help, please let us know. There, we're done. Wow, I did that fast. Yeah, proud. All right, so catching back up, what do we have for questions? And um, we're going to still be recording for this part. If you would prefer, if you're comfortable asking the question on Zoom, but would prefer to wait, we will stop recording once people have more personal questions to ask. So any more broad questions that you don't mind having on the recording? Yes, I have one. Elena, Alyssa, thank you for taking care of all of this for us. This has been really amazing. But I'm kind of curious about whether or not you have examples you can point us to for incorporating the research into your presentation because there's always, it, I know it's going to depend on what are you doing it for. Are you doing it for an ANS competition? Are you doing it for a display? Are you doing it inside of a class? But there's, pulling together the research is one thing. How do you show it in context of what you're doing? That often leaves me kind of with my fingers in my hair. Mm. I mean, I think you've already nailed part of it is that it really does vary, you know. So for me, how I share my document, you know, my research is very different. In this class, I included a few citations at the end. Uh, you have the bibliography, uh, or, what I call it? Yeah, bibliography. Um, and I cite the different um, academic sources I used for the definitions of primary, secondary, and tertiary source. Honestly, I don't think I was super needed there. I really included it as a modeling situation where I could show you, hey, I, you know, this is something that people aren't sure about. So I went, I found these sources, I put them in here, and here's how I show them. So it was almost kind of an example there. But in general, when I'm teaching content-based SEA courses, um, uh, like I taught one on, I actually teach one on tablet weaving that has a bit, but it's mostly techniques-based but I teach a um, uh, textiles uh, 15th century fashion one, and it has a very extensive uh, bibliography at the end of, hey, here's a bunch of useful sources. And I actually annotated that one, I think, um, to break down um, not just here's where I got my information, but also here's, you might find these sources useful for your purposes as well. Uh, so it's, it definitely 
is going to vary depending on the purpose of the class versus a display. Uh, for myself, uh, if you'd like, I can link some examples of my past documentation. Um, I have a lot of them on my East Kingdom. Actually, I have a bunch on my East Kingdom wiki, and you can see some of my, the papers I've written, um, some of my blog posts uh, on different topics, and some of my ANS documentation. Um, and it definitely varies uh, as I try to multitask and fail at it miserably. There we go. Um. And anyone uh, looking at this on YouTube, um, uh, all of this stuff is also available on my personal website, which is linked in the at the top of the handout. Um, that uh, link at the top takes you to where I hold the handout on my personal web page, which has all of these different bits of documentation and things and whatnot, um, which I probably just should have linked in as well uh, uh, here instead. Uh, but if you scroll down to the classes taught I have a, uh, and the documentation, uh, I have a lot of my old documentation on there and you can see <sighs> It varies depending on the project. Um, usually I like having a lot of citations because I'm a perfectionist and the idea of me being wrong is utterly terrifying even though I know it's totally common and definitely will happen. So I like avoiding that as much as possible or at least hedging my bets by saying, look, I'm not saying that this is how this was done in period. I'm just saying Penelope Walton Rogers in this book published by Oxford University Press says this is how it was done in period. Um, so I use a lot of citations. Um, and I also find it helpful for, for multiple reasons. Uh, and you can see that there, I probably cite more than is sometimes needed. Um, if I'm doing it for like an ANS display, I'm probably not going to worry nearly so much. I'm going to be talking much more verbally of like, oh, you could see in Frick that he says this. I'm not going to specify the page number or whatnot, um, but I will have my notes on hand. If someone really wanted to ask, I'm like, oh, well, um, it should be in my documentation on this project that you find on my wiki, which honestly is why I post everything to the wiki and to my personal website, because that way I don't have to hold it in my brain. I can keep it <laughs> out. I'm very big into outsourcing things, so I'm not having to hold them in my brain. So, um, did, did that answer the question? I got very rambly. It's okay. Keep rambling. That worked. There was a lot in there. Um, the, the short answer is yes, you answered the question. Um, okay, good. I've, I've posted in the chat a couple of places where you can look and see different types of presentations for that. And I'm looking forward to scrambling through all of that material. Um, I, I, I think that's where the, I need to pause it and think for a while. Thank you. You got it. And I, I believe we're connected on Facebook. So if you want to chat through this stuff, again, I'm on, I'm dealing with a, a hip problem that, that needs surgery, but is being delayed. So as a result, I'm on just round the clock, weird meds and very loopy. So uh, I make no, pr I will be very rambly and interesting, but I'm happy to chat with people in the meantime, just... <laughs> be forewarned. Uh, but if you have further questions and want to go into this more, uh, hit me up there. We can do it by chat or we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one via Zoom or Meets or whatever. So just let me know. And th that goes for everyone, by the way. So um, one comment and then one question from the chat. Um, we have one comment that says, Bernadette Banner's videos on YouTube are a helpful example of how to show research in a non-essay format. She often includes notes and, bibliograph and bibliographic info in her video description. So I just wanted to put, out there, put that out there for those who are listening to this. Um, we also had a question about uh, sort of like a very specific uh, citation style question. Um, like what do you do when your source contains multiple books by the same authors? And really for something like that, you can, you can look up how to do it in a certain citation style. If anybody gives you any grief or anything because it's not in the citation style they want, um, at the very least for King and Queens, that's not something that should be considered as long as how you cite it is clear, that your judges can tell that these are multiple books by the same author. 
Um, so kind of going back to what Elena said, the style doesn't have to be perfect as long as the judges can get the information they need from them. So that was the only additional question. I don't know if you have other thoughts on that, Elena. Uh, no, I think that's completely it. It's usually when issues run in with citations um, at, for KQANS, the issue isn't, oh, you didn't cite, you know, you included a comma where there should have been a period. Usually the issue is your format was different enough that the people judging it couldn't easily look at what you were saying and understand what sources or where they should go to find that information. Um, so it's, we're, we're not checking periods versus commas, uh, but if you are using a highly specialized format, um, uh, as I think the comment was it's a math journal technique, um, that's something that you might want to consider something that is either more broad or putting a note in there to explain to your judges, you know, this is this, you know, um, technique, uh, this means this, this means that, because I, I personally do not read any math journals and would probably have also been very confused. Uh, but as long as people can uh, easily follow the information, the specific format you use is not an issue. Actually, that's a good point because we get questions like that that pop up a lot where people say, um, you've said that this should, isn't something we're judged on, but then I was judged negatively on it. And it's usually a misunderstanding in that line. We've also had people say like, oh, well, I was told um, I wouldn't be misjudged um, for typographic errors, but the thing that came in had so many, it was almost impossible to follow. There was no breakdown of ideas. And so the issue wasn't, oh, you had a couple of typos. The issue was, it was incohesive to a point where your judges couldn't actually find the information they were looking for, which again is a very important distinction. We're not grading you on anything like that for a variety of reasons. Um, but it is important that the people looking at it are able to relatively easily understand what it is you are saying. And if you're not sure, send it stuff to us ahead of time. We can do consultations. We can give advice. Um, we can, and we have lots of different support options. Additionally, um, my work mundanely, uh, I said I teach reading and research, but my specialty is working with um, at-risk populations. So I work with non-native English speakers and students with disabilities. Um, and so if you are concerned that ANS is not an option for you due to ex an accessibility option um, or, or like a background knowledge information, you feel it's inaccessible to people without a college degree, um, please check in with me. I am very happy uh, to help give advice on how we can make sure that you are as successful as you would like to be uh, regardless of uh, accessibility needs. Can I chime in here also? So the MOAS office is well staffed with people who can field all those kinds of things. If you're really concerned that your English is bad and you don't, that you're worried that people don't understand what you're saying. So one of my mundane job is an English professor. And so I will happily glance at it and tell you if you know what, your sentence structure is such that I can't follow your idea. You know, I'm not gonna copy edit your paper for you, but I'd be happy to just tell you, yes, I understand what you're saying or no, I don't. So, and I think, so Liz is a librarian, I'm an English professor, Elena's a research professor, so the MOAS office can cover you on all bases. Oh, also that, yes, to all of that. And then on top of that, that made me think also for entering KQANS, this is getting slightly off topic, but I just wanna point it out there. Um, we do also offer translation services. So if you are more comfortable writing in your native language and you would prefer, and you would like um, assistance translating it, um, or you would like someone to translate it for you, or you would even like to be judged, we can't promise, but we can try. If you would like to try for us to try to find judges for your native language, uh, we are very committed to making the process as accessible as possible. Um, and we can definitely find translation assistance for you to make sure that you're able to get judged and display the way you would like to be done. So any sorts of accessibility issues in that general field, hit us up. Um, this is something that's a passion for all of us uh, and we are very happy to help. Any more questions before we turn recording off? 
do not see any more questions in the chat. So if nobody else has any other questions, I can stop recording. Wonderful. Thank you all very much.